Well, hello. Hello, folks. Welcome back to Two Guys in the Bible. We've gone liberal. With... We took the gun out of the back. We took the assault weapon out because we know how frightening it is for some. We don't want to offend. Yeah, yeah. I, you know, and this is a safe space. Yeah. You know, we don't want to trigger. We want to be sensitive. <laughs> Not no pun intended. We don't want to trigger. <laughs> yeah. we, are, we want to be sensitive to the snowflakes. Yeah. Actually, we're just back here in this building. We're not at your barn because duck season's over. It's a sad day. Really, hunting's over. We can still hunt predators like coyotes and bobcats and stuff. Wild and, pigs. And pigs. Uh, but that's... You know, but you can do it all the time. Yeah. There's something unique about a season when yeah. it's like dedicated to killing animals. I hope that didn't offend anybody. <laughs> okay, sorry. Trigger warning. We'll put the trigger warning down in the description below. For <clears throat> anyway, uh, so <clears throat> I do have my trusty sidekick right here. Lots of big things this week. There's a lot of news, man. A lot of news. Some tragic, and others is, is, is also tragic, uh, but in a different way. In a different way, but uh, yeah. So we'll, we'll spend a few minutes talking about current events and. So you and I would have been, we would have been prime, growing up in the prime Kobe Bryant era. See what's interesting. I did anyways. Yeah, it, we, we got to see, I got to see Michael Jordan in his prime, mm -hmm. Kobe mm -hmm. and LeBron. I've seen them all in their mm -hmm. prime. Uh, mm -hmm. And I know there's some greats that came before that. And now we may be seeing Luka Doncic in his prime. I'm not kidding. The dude is incredible. But can we just say that it's going to be hard to be like the GOAT, Luca, whatever his name. Like, it's not easy to pronounce his name. Can you change oh, his name so it'll be he, easier? Can you pronounce, change your name, your last <laughs> it's name easier to for like us. Smith? <laughs> <clears throat> uh, but anyway. But it, um, when it came on the, the news thing, the first thing that <clears throat> came to my mind was not... I'm somehow emotional because I didn't know Kobe and Brian and just watched him. But sports players have an effect when you watch them a long time. You know, you watch them in yeah. championship games. You feel like you kind of know. Yeah, because you've watched them so much. Yeah. And, but I think what was heartbreaking was the kid, there's children left, a wife. There's a, other families on that plane. There were a husband and a wife. And so there daughter. was, and a daughter. So two other siblings lost. You know, over half of the family. Yeah. Um, and so, but it was, it, it's the brevity of life. That life is really a vapor. It's here today and gone tomorrow. We all have an appointed time. Um, wants to die and then the judgment. Yes. And um, so just, it, it, cause he's 41 years old. I mean, you're what? What are you? What's that matter? You're 30. I'm 33. I'm 36. 36. I'm going to be 33. So, five years. Yeah. Done. You know what I'm saying? So it's. Oh, I'm, I know. You, you mean it's. I mean, I've had uh, a girl I graduated with uh, got not diagnosed with breast cancer I don't know, a year ago, and she's gone now. Yeah, I mean it's that aggressive. I mean it's just you never know. Of course, car wrecks happen all the time. And, uh, and I think, like I shared with you this morning, Jesus' perspective on tragedies—we want to call them tragedies—he he would have saw them as providence. Right. Um, there was eighteen people apparently in his time, but that, that was known that a tower fell on them. Okay, so. That's a rant, in a sense, random. It seems random. It yeah. seems random in, by perspective. And it kills them. And he looks at the disciples and says, do you think that they were worse offenders than all the others who lived? But then it, the, the big thing is he says, no, but unless you repent, you will, like, um, you will all likewise perish. And, and that's... That's where he's trying to get all of us to think when we see a helicopter fall in the mountains, a big star that we've all seen dies at 41 years old. Repent. 
or you're going to perish. Right. And, and we don't know anything about Billy Bryant. Yeah, I have no idea about his uh, his his spiritual life. And, uh, right. I mean, soul, I hope yeah. he was a Christian. I have no idea. That's not the point. The point is that we're trying to make is none of us are promised tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And when, you, when the nation sees, the world sees, you know, an event like this that we saw last Sunday, um, people start thinking about mm -hmm. eternity. Mm -hmm. Like churches were filled after 9-11. Mm -hmm. I mean, for the next few weeks, they were packed to the brim. I mean, why? Because it's on people's minds. Um, after uh, Hurricane Harvey that wrecked, you know, southern Texas, mm -hmm. same thing. Mm -hmm. The churches were packed because people want answers. They were like, okay, why um, does this mean something? Like, you start thinking about eternity. Mm -hmm. When the Black Plague swept through Europe, back in the... Do, Churches were packed, and death was everywhere. You you seriously woke up every day, yeah, that, wondering if it's going to be your last death. And you know, here's an interesting thing: uh, if you'll if you go over there today, you'll still see like right outside of many churches is a cemetery mm -hmm. because it was if you go into this one and into this one, yeah, and it's it is a kindness of God. To preach to us by the picture, right? It's just right there. Yeah. Death. That's going to happen to every one of you. Somehow, it's going to be a helicopter. It's going to be cancer. It's going to be a car accident. It's going to be old age. What? Something. You you're going to get there. Yeah. Every one of us, and so all of us have to deal with. Then what? Right. Yeah. What's next? And the Bible says judgment. Yes. And so you stand in judgment and you need an advocate with the Father. And there's only one advocate and with the Father, is. the that, Lord Jesus that's, Christ. And that's just the good news of the gospel. Mm -hmm. Like we, <laughs> we are horrible. Mm -hmm. Listen, people... People really miss, don't, do not understand two fundamental truths. They really are as bad as the Bible says they are. And God really is as merciful and as loving as the Bible says he is. Mm -hmm. Those are two things mm -hmm. that people fail to understand. Like, I, I do you give this simple illustration all the time. It's not necessarily original with me, but it, it, it does hit home. Imagine if I could just put a microchip in your head, right? Mm -hmm. And for the next couple of weeks, it records everything you think, do, and say. And at the end of these two weeks, you come back, I right, take that microchip out, and uh, you walk into a room, and there's all, everyone you know, family, friends, coworkers, everyone you know. And I take that microchip and I plug it in the computer. And we're all going to sit there and watch everything you thought, said, and did for the last two weeks. Okay? You would run out of there as fast as you could. But that is the reality of every single human being that's ever walked this earth. Mm -hmm. We're all that bad. No one would want that to be seen. Mm -hmm. The and because God is good and He is just, He can't just turn a blind eye to that kind of depravity. Mm -hmm. It has to be dealt with, and it has to be dealt with severely so He can display His justice. The good news of the gospel is this, that Jesus Christ left His rightful place in heaven and came and stood in our place when He went to the cross and became the substitute for us. Mm -hmm. All that wrath and punishment that we deserve for all that depravity we think, do, and say every day, He took on Himself. And when we place, when we repent, when we turn from those sins and turn in faith to Jesus, God takes our unrighteousness mm -hmm. and puts it on His Son. And He crushed Him on that cross. And in exchange, he took the righteousness of Christ and imputed it to us. Mm -hmm. And that's the good news. And that's what we have 
to come to terms with in this life because once this life is over, it's too late. You're not getting a second chance. Yeah, and I, that's what, when we experience death on any level in our family, out there, when someone in the culture who's big and known and famous or whatever, um, we have to, we've got to come to, we, we ought to respond with more than thoughts, prayers, tributes. It ought to soberly get us all to think about death and the reality of death, eternity, the things of God. Um, and um, as Christians, it ought to motivate us. Uh, think about this. Did anybody, I'm not saying they didn't, I don't know. Yeah. This, the question that comes to my mind is, did anybody share the gospel with him? Was he ever, was he ever told the gospel of Jesus Christ? Was he ever, yeah. did anyone ever sit down and say, here's, here's the gospel, yeah. here's the reality. Um, I mean, it should, it should hoping, motivate the Christians to greater um, witness and obedience to the Great Commission. Man, it should, if we just, uh, we talk about this all the time, and Brother Michael, we, were, we had a little pastor's gathering here last Saturday. He talked about it too. If we could just stop having tunnel vision on the current mm -hmm. and start thinking and seeing eternally, mm -hmm. I think we'd be... You know, more take the great, the great Commission a lot more seriously mm -hmm. because it is. I mean, people are going to spend eternity somewhere. Yeah. yeah. And uh, anyway, yeah. I mean, just share the gospel because you you never know. You mm -hmm. really never know. Uh, and then I think that I think a lot about the gospel when um, I'm looking at the current events of, of, our, of our government. How do you change a train wreck like that? Well, the only, only thing, the, yeah. only the gospel, right? I mean, it's like, if you didn't have the gospel, you look at that thing and go, that thing is never, I mean, there's no hope. It, you know, you it, almost think there's no hope now. <laughs> <laughs> but when you have the gospel, you know there's something that can, it can. Someone that can change the, tr the the utter train wreck that's going on up there. It is a nightmare, and uh, there's know, no justice like, like we in it. Talking about before before we started the show, like I we do we sit here and we talk about it and we get so just absolutely frustrated and angry at all the silliness mm -hmm. and the deception and lying and corruption that. I mean, anybody that's actually paying any kind of attention uh, can see. Mm -hmm. And Cody was like, what do you think about it? If you and I were lost, and let's say we were in Congress or the Senate or something like that, and we had a little bit of power and somebody said, hey, you can't vote this way or do this. All you have to do is say yes, or all you have to do is say no. Here's, you know, a wad of cash. Uh, we'd probably do it. And absolutely, that's the problem. People are lost mm. and need Christ. There's no, there's no Holy Spirit that looks at that situation in them and says, this isn't pleasing to God. Yeah, they don't know. And so you have a group of people that have no guidance of truth and justice, right? Who, I, listen, I'm not a forever Trumper. I'm not. I didn't vote for him to begin with. Why don't you buy that Trump underwear? <laughs> um, and so I did. I voted for someone else, and then when it was left to him, I you know had to vote for him because I'm not wasn't going to vote for Hillary. Um, here's here's one guy. Put it this way: if you have to hold your nose while you vote for Trump because of the alternative. I get that. Mm -hmm. But if you are a nonstop cheerleader for everything mm -hmm. the guy does, mm -hmm. like many are, mm -hmm. 
you know, you might want to check your heart. Mm -hmm. And that's, I think that's pretty, pretty Yeah, cool. because, but here's what I can't handle. Anybody being literally just attacked day after day for things that are baseless. Yeah. Right. With it's slander and with, yeah, with no truth, with the utter ignore it, it just ignore outright ignoring everything else. Right. I mean, what the Democrats are doing to Trump or trying to can show what he did, it's already proven that Creepy Joe did it. He said, and like, they're not we talking. have his voice on a recording that's public. And he literally said what they're saying Trump did, which he actually didn't do. Yeah. So anyway, Which, you know, if he even if he did, I'm going to be honest with you, I, I might trigger some people. Even if he did say, hey, Ukraine, check this out. Or I'm withholding funds to from you. I really don't care. It was corruption. He has the right to investigate corruption. It, Every president we've ever had has done something to that effect. Yeah. And so I, I, I just... When we, we as Christians have to look through uh, the scriptures and, and how we, we want justice and truth and, and those things to, to win the day. And so that means for even people that we want them to experience the common grace of God in justice and truth. Well, Uncle Ben said it right, Spider-Man. Mm -hmm. Okay, go ahead and hit me with your best shot. With great power comes great responsibility. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, our government and a lot of world governments have an unlimited amount of power. Mm -hmm. that, that's unfortunate because that's not the way it was supposed to happen. But now they do. Mm -hmm. And you couple that power with what I'm about to read here, because we still haven't even read I read some. Okay. But I'm going to read this. You couple that power with this reality, and this is what we're seeing today. You ready? Hang on. None is righteous, no, not one. No one understands. No one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. Their throat is an open grave. They use their tongues to deceive the venom of asps is under their lips. Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. In their paths are ruin and misery. In the way of peace they have not known. Why all this? There is no fear of God before their eyes. Mm -hmm. So you couple a, a government or any kind of institution with an enormous amount of power with this kind of depravity and no fear of God whatsoever. And this is the result we get. And, which, and, and only the gospel fixes these things. Yeah, which comes right after this. Mm -hmm. Right. Paul goes into the gospel right after right. this. Um, so. What, else, what are the current events? That, uh, oh, the corona. <laughs> so yes. corona is giving people a virus? Is that how <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's it. Is that it? Uh, I mean, I, I guess it's, I don't know. It's just funny to me when they make, it's like breaking news. There's this new virus. And then they say things like, it's infected hundreds in the world. I'm like, hundreds in the world? Well, you, you, there's you've like, never read any history? But I'm sitting there going, there's seven billion of us. Seven and a half, yeah. And there's been a few hundred in the world. Like, I'm not... Understanding how this is some giant, I don't know, I just get. Yeah, and, and, <laughs> man, and just, I just want to. It's like they ran out of things to talk about. Every few years they do this with the virus. Yeah. I think the previous one was Ebola. Oh, gosh. Right? Yeah. Remember the Ebola virus? Yeah. Then you had, you know, West Nile is a reoccurring one. Um, 
Listen, all these horrible things, yeah, they're horrible things, but are they uh, these epidemics that people are scared they're going to be? Uh, Again, yeah. here's the thing. When you have an entire culture who doesn't fear God, does not look at death as the reality of life and what's going to happen, you're afraid of a whole bunch of things. Yeah. You're terrified of it. When you're not right with Christ, you're, not, you're terrified of everything that comes down the pipe. You just are. And here's another thing I'll say. If you hold to a... And I know most of you watching are... You're not going to watch this unless you're a Christian, I would think. But we can't ever assume anything. But you do know somebody that's not. And so we, help some, we hope that sometimes you get something that would help you talk to somebody, mm -hmm. your friends and family that are, that are unbelievers. And every, every time something like this comes up, it's a good, it's a good time to do that because mm -hmm. they'll, be, they'll come right along with you and mm -hmm. talk about how tragic the helicopter crash mm -hmm. that killed Kobe Bryant was. They'll talk about how tragic this coronavirus mm -hmm. is. And, you know, people are losing their lives. And it, it, it is. It really is. The difference is when we believe the Bible, we have a foundational basis to say that these things are mm -hmm. tragic, to say these things are sad. If you hold to a naturalistic, materialistic worldview in which we are just have evolved from pond scum and our ancestors were fish, there's then tragedy doesn't actually exist. Mm -hmm. It's just matter in motion. It's the it's naturalism playing itself out. So you, they don't. Yeah, they're going to sit there and complain, but why? Mm -hmm. It's just the way the cookie crumbles. Mm -hmm. right? We have a foundational base to say, man, this is sad, and we have something to deal with it. Yeah, and we have hope. There's one. There's one in whom we can have comfort and peace and deal with it. I'm, I'm, death is a horrible, horrible enemy. It's an enemy. The Bible calls it, it an is. enemy. It's the last, it is the enemy. And it's, it's horrible to go through. People that kind of, without, I mean, just kind of, dismiss the whole idea that any Christian, you know, they're just kind of real flippant about it, that any Christian who who's horrified of death um, it is somehow not in a right place as a Christian. I, I just don't buy into that because it is a horrible, horrible, horrible thing. Um, but we have one who could, okay, if you take Psalm 23, it's quoted all the time. I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. We're constantly in there. Yeah, and and you that that's that's a place of that does produce can produce fear, anxieties, things like that. So it's not that we might be completely void of those things, but it's that we have one who walk through them, even the fear, even the heartache, even the the horrificness of of death, um, and so. We have, we have the answer. The Bible has the answer. Christ is the answer. He's for our us. living. And in First Peter, He is our living right. hope. Right. In this fallen world where things happen. Right. Um, and so, one of the things that we've been wanting to talk about each week um, that we think is a big problem is. In God's design, he's, he's had these um, these three institutions, the family, the church, and government. And because of everything we're talking about, the depravity of man, the sinfulness of man, the lack of the fear of God, those three institutions have been utterly wrecked just wrecked yeah okay um and we have an answer the gospel and christ and god's wisdom and words for those institutions um 
And so many of the things that we struggle with and look to in this culture and in this world is a problem because those three things are out of order. Yes. Primarily out of order. Those are foundations for... Yes, for all of good, productive, wholesome society. And the first one is the family. Yeah. The family's been utterly destroyed. Just utterly dis- so destroyed and perverted that when good Christians submit to the word of God and try to do what it says, they're looked upon as weird cult-like goofballs. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Like, what are you doing? We really are. And God said we'd be aliens and sojourners. This isn't our land. So I, I, I'm not saying we need to look a certain... I'm not saying, you know, we want to look... It's not a surprise. Right. Yeah, it's just it was the reality. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I mean, when you... But isn't the problem now that we have people that profess Christians that look at us and say we're weird? Yeah, and, and again, <laughs> that's kind of why we started this whole thing is to reach Christians in our community right. and try to encourage everyone to take what they say they believe more seriously. Believe in the sufficiency of Scripture. Yeah. I mean, if you're going to be say you're a Christian, believe the Bible. Sola Scriptura. I mean, I can't stand... I mean, there's preachers out there that don't talk about sin. There's preachers out there that don't... Uh, if they were sit down and they were put, you know, to, to, to the fire, they say, you have to answer this question. Is Jesus the only way anybody can be saved? And if they don't believe and repent and place their faith in Jesus, they're going to hell. There's a lot of preachers that say, well, you know, I don't know. You know, no. Yes. He's the only way. Repent and turn to him or perish. Yeah. And so then we go further because like Joel Osteen's low hanging fruit. Right? I mean, that's Joel. You well, have, I mean, all those TV evangelists are. Yeah, they're, they're all. They're, but the problem we have is we have people who are Baptistic, say the Bible is the authority, and say Jesus is Lord, and that he's even Lord over all things. And yet, you look at their life, their family, their the church. You go, well, where do you get off in thinking that the head of the church, the master, and the Lord of you, your family, and the church told you that was what you ought to be doing? Because if he's Lord, he's king, he had to put down somewhere how he wants you to operate. I I think people, they're good with saying Jesus is Lord. They're not good with behaving as if he is Lord. Right. And that's why in Matthew 7, Mm. he says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom Mm. of heaven. Mm. He's talking about professing Christians. Mm. Like, they call him Lord. Yeah, and and he says, you're a wise man if you build your house right. on what I've, what I've said on my, on my words. And so let's take a, let's take one in particular. Let's start with the family. Okay. Now we're talking about a Christian family. We're talking about, we understand. Yeah. Legitimately. We, this the, just shows for Christians. Yes. Even though we talk about unbelievers. A lot. And the gospel fixes the perversion of the broken family in our society. Yeah. The dad that's a derelict, the mom that's sensual, worldly, and carnal, and the kids that are rebellious and worldly, the gospel heals that. The gospel comes and and deals with that sin and and, and calls those people to repent. But let's talk about now they, God has come, the gospel has come, Jesus has saved, now what? Because now we have a whole bunch of people saying, Jesus saved me, the gospel's come, I'm a Christian, 
and yet they're the family unit still looks like one who hasn't been affected by the gospel of Jesus Christ. Yeah. So, what do you want to start with first? So why, we, well, we have to figure out... We have to figure out why that is. And, and we talked about it a little bit last week already. And understand this, when we're talking about a, a family that has come to faith in Christ... But it still still looks like you know every other carnal worldly family. We're not saying it's because they want to look that way, right? Some may, and some we're, may yeah, not. Some, we're, we're saying that it's it's the product of living in this fallen world, and um, where the institution of family has been attacked. And I, I think there are a lot of even Christians out there, CA, who are doing family life. Just like they've always seen, it may not even necessarily, it may be just morally neutral, you know, but they're, but they're, they are neglecting the clear commandments of the scriptures for their family. Maybe because they haven't been taught. The proof that they're a Christian or not is if they're taught, they'll receive it. Yeah. Because they have the spirit of truth yeah. living in them. And so they'll, they'll, they'll hear it. But. Uh, so I would say that the, the, one of the tenets, one of the foundational uh, things that has broken down the family. Again, I feel like a broken record here, but it's like we, you can't be a tight knitted, woven together family if everyone's constantly out of the house. Yeah, if everyone, so we need yeah. to, the world, when I say we need to, I'm talking about the world, we need to convince the family that sitting at home together it, all the time is weird. Everybody needs to be signed up for something. Everybody needs to be doing something. Dad needs to work 70 hours a week. Uh, maybe mom needs to work too. Uh, Larry, uh, you know, needs to play baseball and basketball. Susie needs to take dance. I don't know. I'm just kidding. Susie <laughs> needs to take dance and, you know, have recitals yeah. all the time. And listen, my kids play baseball. Mm -hmm. Okay, I have two sons. They both play baseball. We we go do things. I'm not saying you can't do that. You're not Little House on the Prairie or something. <laughs> yeah. Right. I mean, all I'm saying is when you... We only have... I mean, just think about it. If you're you're married and have children, how many how much time in the evening do you spend at home? How much time in the morning do you spend at home? Mm -hmm. That's what I'm saying. Well, and there's things that have driven that, right? Materialism has driven yeah. the desire for material things, the desire for a certain level of, and I'm not talking about basic things to survive because some families. By God's providence, they do need both to work just to survive. Yeah. Okay, I I get that, but I'm talking about above the level of surviving, where Paul says, "Be content if you have food and clothing and a roof over your head." The basic necessities. We've elevated that, right? Yeah. To like in East Texas, we need a we need the newest vehicle, right? We need a certain type of home. We need all of these things. So materialism has driven that. The lie that was told in the feminine, feminine, feminism movement, right? Yeah. About the woman. Yeah. And her role and her place and her um, responsibilities in, and that we needed to set them free from the patriarchal society type living um, to be out there being I have nothing wrong with women being successful. Let's define success. Successful based on what? On what the world standard is. Is usually what successful means today. Not, yeah. not on the godly Standard. So again, I'm not talking about families that have to have both of those individuals to work in order yeah. to provide basic needs. I'm talking about when both people think they have to work 
because they're carnal, materialistic, and in love with themselves. Yeah. This is the things that, that people, this is what we mean by soul of scripture. The, the scripture talks about this. Like The scripture talks about the wife and the mom and the, the dad and the children and, and how that whole thing is to function. Yeah. We don't want to be legalistic and say, well, you can't be involved in it. The Bible doesn't speak to can we be involved with baseball or yeah. dance class or something, whatever. But it does talk about what we ought to be doing. And so we ought to make sure those are being done before we're playing baseball, dance class. Yeah, the so whole reason I brought that is it's just it's time management mm -hmm. is a big part of this. Mm -hmm. And that's what I that's the only reason I brought that up is we're so busy, everyone's going a everyone in the family has is going a different direction to the point where sometimes mom's sitting there like, Well, how am I gonna get Larry to baseball and Susie to dance? They have to be, you know, there at the same time. Mm -hmm. Dad's off at work because he has to work 70 or 80 hours a week. Um, you know, I have everything that's going on in my life. You know, that's what I'm talking about. Like the family is dysfunctional because society has deemed it weird and patriarchal for a woman to just be a woman. Yeah, at home. And I'm not saying... Women, you need to stay home right. and be cooking. What, what I mean by at home is receiving joyfully the wonderful responsibility that God has given to care for children, to nurture them in the fear of the admonition of the Lord, to love and serve their husband and their home, and, and to, I mean, all of those things that he, he, he deals with in the scriptures. Those were not just cultural things. We need to stop saying stuff like that. There were cultural things. Yeah. One thing that you and I have talked about that was probably somewhat of a cultural thing was a, a head covering type thing, right? Now, we've, we've, some go back and forth, but some would say that's a cultural... That's a, that's a thing that I say, okay, we can deal with that. We can go back and forth. But some are saying it's a cultural thing. From passages of scripture that are very explicit and clear, <laughs> right. is what I'm saying. Is yeah. why I'm using those as an example. Um, and so, when the family has bought into a lie, and that lie is God doesn't know what's best for your family. It's the same lie that was in the garden. And we, it comes down to: Are we going to believe God, or are we going to believe? ourselves yeah. and the culture. Does God know what's best for mom? Does God know what's best for dad? Does God know what's best for the family? And the answer is yes, he does. And as Christians, we ought to joyfully submit to that. Yeah. And walk in that the best that we can according to the providence God's placed us in. Providentially, there are some people who cannot do that. Right? Um, they'd be way below the poverty level if both didn't work. They wouldn't be able, you know what I mean? Yeah, I and we're not saying, my wife works. Mm -hmm. She yeah. does hair. Yeah, we're not saying that uh, they can't work. Yeah, I mean, that's not what we're saying. We're you're with saying. Proverbs 31? That yeah. woman got after it. Yeah. Right? Yeah. No, no, that's, yeah, just. Again, when we talk about these things, some people take it the wrong way. They think we're talking about women need to be at home making sandwiches barefoot and pregnant. Yeah, yeah. And that, that's not what that's we're, not what we're about, saying. You know, my, at all. Like I said, my wife does hair and it, it, it helps our family. Yes. And, uh, you know, but we make it work. You know, I'm, I'm in, by God's grace, I'm in full time ministry. And so if she needs to be at work, I can have my boys with me and, and we homeschool them. And so. You know, she has them most of the week. I have them a couple of days. It just, we, it works, mm -hmm. right? And, uh, and we're not nowhere near perfect. Don't get me wrong there. Uh, but, and the whole reason that we're, we're even discussing this is if someone else has our children, they're being discipled by someone else. Yeah, and that's, well, we're getting a little sneak peek into to the next topic, mm -hmm. right? But that's exactly the point of breaking down the family to begin with, mm -hmm. is to get the children. 
Mm -hmm. And uh, so we, we we should probably stop here because this yeah. is going long. Uh, so that's probably where we'll pick up next week after we talk about more current events mm -hmm. and this never-ending news world of news cycles. Yeah, um, it's gonna be like Fox News and it'd be like breaking every day. Breaking news. Breaking. Breaking. <laughs> John Bolton <laughs> writes a book. All right. Anyway. That apparently has been in print for several months and we just now found just it. Just now. <laughs> During the impeachment trial. Well, anyway. we pray that this has been um, edifying to the saints, and we pray that it's brought some conviction to those in sin, and it's been glorifying to God. So that's our prayer each each week. Amen. So, thanks for watching, guys.